Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now then, on this Monday evening, URC season is up and running, as are we. Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent is here in studio. You're very welcome. Thanks for popping in. Thanks, Joe. We'll and see Keith Wood is with us remotely. Long time no talk. Hello. I'm very remote, Joe. How are you? Always remote. Yeah, very well. I was about to say the rugby is back, Keith, but I mean, it's never really gone. That's kind of what strikes you about the summer at the moment. No, it never really went at all. And um, I think that's actually part of a conversation we should have maybe for a later day. But it seems to be rolling on from one level to the next, um, pretty much never ending for everybody. And I won't say it's hard to be excited. I am excited to see rugby back in the more traditional fashion at this time of the year. Um, It's quite hard when you're watching the stuff during August that doesn't ring true. But um, yeah, it is good to be back. Good to see some of the games and some of the provinces back playing. Mm. Uh, traditionally Rory URC never really starts with much of a bang it's more of a whimper and I think that's uh, pretty true of the weekend just gone that's just the way rugby in this part of the world restarts it's always quiet-ish September territory well it, it feeds into what Keith was talking about there like the, the players who played in New Zealand only finished in late July and need to be given time off because you know they need their bodies to recover I think a lot of them will be back this week so it's actually a bit I think it's going to start a little bit quicker this year than it has done some some years we were three four rounds in before we saw um, the Ireland internationals um, I, but uh, you're right as a result it leads to kind of a bit of a, a phony war I think although it's an 18 game season so <coughs> you can't afford to start too slowly you kind of have to get up and running now Leinster used their game against Zebra pretty much as their second pre-season game probably because they saw it as Zebra but they nearly they conceded five tries and nearly lost the game. Munster and Connacht were particularly slow, whereas Ulster, who didn't have a huge amount of players on that tour, maybe had a better preseason as a result, um, were sharper. But yeah, even we saw Cardiff beat Munster. Cardiff had a lot more of the internationals playing. They had Fallatown, Liam Williams starting, and we got injured. But you could see the disparity between it. But it's up and running. It, there was some decent stuff. There was some not so decent stuff. But it's 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 that's what we have now. Until there's no you, there's no Champions Cup until December. So it's it's what we have until November. So um, just for any of you uh, not paying close attention over the weekend, on the Saturday it was Ulster against Connacht, so 36 points to 10. Ulster uh, winners scored five tries. Uh, Zebra Parma, as they're now known, 29. Leinster, 33. And then uh, Cardiff uh, beat Munster 20 points to 13. So to give you a sense of next week, uh, Leinster and Friday Night Action, they have bended on at the RDS on the Saturday, Ulster away to Scarlet's lunchtime. And then Connacht have a mini South African swing. They're Stormers, the defending champions, away. And then Bulls the week after. And then on the Sunday, it's back to Wales for Munster. They'll play the Dragons. And I guess if you're kind of looking into week three and week four, week three will have Ulster, Leinster on a Friday night in Belfast. Week four will have Connacht against Munster. So that's a general sense of where we are over the next uh, couple of weeks. We might start with Ulster, Connacht. Ulster 36 Connacht, 10 points, uh, five tries, bonus point win. Uh, For the first 27 minutes, this wasn't uh, all that alive. And then uh, moment of magic from Stuart McCluskey and set up Luke Marshall, who's back after two tough years of injury. And from that point on, relatively comfortable for Ulster, Rory? Too comfortable from a Connacht point of view. Um, A pretty dispiriting night for them. But if we start with Ulster, I thought they were very impressive and they have been they are in my opinion the second best team in Ireland at the moment um, they came closer than anyone to winning the URC last year they were minutes away from it away to the Stormers and if they'd knocked the Stormers out they would have had a home final against the Bulls um, seven days later and the way they dismantled Munster in that quarter final last year in, in Kingspan Stadium was ridiculously impressive you know some of the things they're able to do the way they play the game their, their attacking approach their mall, which is a less glamorous side of it, that they're able, they're very um, tight, effective attacking mall. They used it against Connacht at the weekend, and then they have in McCluskey, a player who doesn't necessarily get called up in November in Six Nations, but he's of the caliber that if he went, if he was from a different country, you probably have a lot more caps. So he, he, and he's not alone. They have a lot of very good players who are just below that threshold of Ireland, and that that can sometimes lead to having a very, very good club side. So I thought they were very impressive, and Jacob Stockdale came back as well, which was probably the headline uh, in terms of the way he played. He was very, very good, and he looked back to. I mean, it's too early to kind of start talking about twenty eighteen form again, but you know, he's at, you add him to the mix a year out from the World Cup, and you think what he could do 
to say James Lowe in terms of putting a rocket underneath him that that that, that, Lowe, that, that Stockdale is there as well it was a really good night for them and they have more players to come back in the next couple of weeks as well so they're in a very very good place Um you know, Scarlet's away. They they should they fancy that, and then they get like to beat Leinster twice last year. They they'll fancy that game up in, in Belfast in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, Stockdale is such an interesting case to keep. Burst on the scene as we all know, twenty eighteen, and it looked like the world was his oyster. And uh, just the last couple of seasons with injury and even some tricky days for Ireland playing at fullback. Uh, now is a, a a good time maybe for him to settle down, play lots of rugby on the wing, and and recapture something. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's it's a little bit too hard to read anything into these games. And I know that the start of the, the, the season, but it makes it very hard. There is, you know, there are different teams with different compositions coming back in and some are far sharper than the others. And one extra game can make all the difference um, at this stage. And there's been an interesting wringing of hands over things that have gone right, wrong or different for the different teams. Uh, having said that, Ulster looked sharp, looked very sharp. Um, when I look at Jacob Stockdale, I I loved the great things he could do in 2018. And um, it was in a team that was um, absolutely on fire, getting the ball into his hands, into space. He, every kick he kicked that whole year seemed to bounce exactly in the right, the right way for him. And everything worked for him. And as invariably happens for young guys that 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 um, almost play their 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 opening games in international games, you get found out fairly quickly. And you get found out on little things like gaps in his defence and um, uh, no understanding of certain types of defence. But it was because he was being accelerated into the Irish system that that looked so stark when he, when he made a mistake. And I think. Ireland persisted with him for quite a long period of time. Then they pushed him to full back, which I thought was was the wrong thing to do for him. And uh, I think he's a winger of unbelievable scoring ability. He needs to make certain he isn't making those mistakes. So he's had an injury, but I would hope that in that period of time, he would have looked on how he's going to play and see it as, as the two sides of the game that he has to be able to do. He has to be able to defend incredibly well. And you still want him to have that joy and ability to go for things because at, at times when he was, there was nobody as good as him. Mm. So um, I think it's it's whether he's matured as well. Um, I guess I say this often, but when young guys get a chance, it's, uh, you know, they're trying to deal with the sense of pressure that doesn't make sense for for people that are nearly ready to retire, the mind kids that are starting out. And I thought he did some truly extraordinary things. I just want to see those again. And I'd like to see what the maturity has done for him, only defensive-wise. I still want him to have a cut. I still want him to have the joy when he goes over the line. Um, and it is great to see him back. I also thought it was great to see Luke Marshall back. I'd forgotten about Luke Marshall. That just shows you how long he's been out of the game. And that's a, a, a bit sad, but... Um, like he ran a perfect line, he was involved in a lovely offload near the end of the game. Um, it's good to see him back. That Ulster back line, everybody fit and firing, is very tasty now. Yeah, and Will Addison's due back in a couple of weeks too. I mean, hopefully he can put his injury troubles behind him. He hasn't been able to do that since he arrived in Ireland, but in the per periods where he's been fit, he's been a sensational player. And you know, he could again come into the Ireland conversation. Another forgotten man, you know, he's he's you kind of almost you know, have have written him off at this stage. But if he comes back and he slots in at fifteen, that frees Lowry up to potentially play ten. You've also just it's just competition and, and yeah, because James Hume will come back probably this week and you know, Luke Marshall's just said to James Hume, like, you've got to fight for this jersey this this week and that that's exactly what Ulster need. I mean, what cost them last year was their their bench in that Stormers game. They they weren't able to close things out and, and sometimes you think that star players can be too comfortable in, in a team like Ulster and, and that's definitely not going to, be the, going to be the case behind the scrum up there and they've signed very interestingly that they've brought in a lot of kind of second tier players to, I think to supplement their bench they haven't really gone for any marquee names um, they got one all back Jeff Tumaga Allen but he wouldn't be from the top the top shelf of all backs they're, they like what they have they're just trying to drive competition and they're in a really really good place I mean they, they, they had a season of real progress last year but they it's 2006 since they last won a trophy and Ian Henderson at the URC launch was talking about how much it, it affects him that he that he's never won anything with his home province and um you know Rory Best wasn't able to long end that long wait and you know Henderson's not 
I'm not going to write him off just yet but like you know like the Munster generation they're, they're all coming towards the end of their careers yeah. having not won anything so there should be a bit of desperation up there as well As for Connacht I saw uh, Peter Wilkins who's been referred to now as head coach mm. which is uh, kind of an interesting um, title all things considered Peter Wilkins was saying we'll take the lessons and uh, go to South Africa and work on some things and he was citing the six penalties conceded in the ten minutes after half time as being where the game was won and lost so they will go and regroup against uh, stern opposition in South Africa uh, there is um maybe an unfair thing to say there is a probably a sense of drift about Connacht at the moment yeah I think that's fair I think this is the end of last season seeping into the start of this season despite all the personnel changes um, they lost some good players they they signed some good players but really th- have they improved I'm not really sure and I think they physically look a bit outmatched against a lot of teams now Ulster aren't really one of those teams that they should be physically outmatched by but Ulster played them off the park in, every, in pretty much every department on the weekend and they were ill-disciplined and they started last season quite well and they were in a reasonably good position and they lost a lot of tight games and they seemed to lose heart from that and their discipline started to slip across those games. You know, the subsequent games, they had that massive hammering over in Edinburgh which was really damaging. Um, they missed Jack Carty at the weekend. He's very important to them. Um, they were without Mac Hansen, Bundyaki, uh, Finley Bealham. They probably missed their internationals more than any, on the other side. But... Um, you know, from a team who were able to win this co- competition, what, six years ago, they look so far away from that now. I'm not saying they're down there with the Dragons and the Zebras, but they finished very low down the table last year. They lost you know, a number of tight enough games, but they're not as competitive as they were. And while Andy Friend has implemented a really good brand, the Ruby brought through some very good players, signed quite well, it does seem like they're just finding it difficult yeah. to keep pace with their rivals it does Keith I mean, if, if we were to watch a highlights reel of their better tries from last year you'd say all is well but all isn't quite well there no it's one of the I, th- I think it's one of the issues in the game is the strength and depth and playing larger um, competitions and I know this has been truncated down to 18 games but sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for and the bringing of South African teams in um, for me with the travel um, with the extra physicality of those teams can make for a very difficult season for um, uh, for all the teams that are up here. And But those with the less strength and depth will suffer the most. And um, you can see teams pulling away just, in, like not in the first weekend, but in the weekends to come just by dint of the effort it takes to hold teams in place for 60 minutes unless you're able to put on a equally proficient um, eight players, you suffer. And um, I look again, I think we'll end up having lots of conversations because of things that have happened over the summer and instances that have happened, both financial or in relation to the laws or no changes to the laws. Mm. But rugby seems to be kind of eating itself alive a little at the moment. So look, I fear at times for, for some of the teams, I don't really fear for Connacht because they may not get to the levels that they got to six years ago, but they play a style that you'd want to support. Um, they need a couple of matches to figure out where they're going to be. We might have this conversation in a month or six weeks' time as to see whether that's more indicative of how the season might go for them. Um, the only downside for it is that you could lose a few matches at the start and you could be you lose your confidence and struggle for that during the year. So, look, I often think when decisions are made it's what sort of impacts they're going to have in the years ahead and um, it'll come, we look at this in a couple of years time as to how beneficial um, having a Celtic league that is incorporated with teams from South Africa will be and there's nothing against the South African teams actually, I think they bring an awful lot to it but I do think it makes it far harder and I don't think you get the amount of rest or easier matches that we used to get. And that was frowned upon, but I don't think you want every single game to be a cup final. I, I think the teams that don't have the wider squads suffer for that. And Rory, just before we go, uh, whispers uh, aplenty that uh, were in Andy Friend's last season. Nothing to stack that up with any yeah, certainty. Yeah, it yet. seems to be the, the, the mood music about it, that you know he's, he's done his time and, and that... Um, that time is, is coming to a, to an end. He, you know he's a long way from home, um, and Pete Wilkins has steadily been promoted through the ranks. And it looks like they're they're kind of there's a succession plan being put in place for for Andy Friend whenever he does step away. And 
like coaches don't stay in jobs very long at the best of times particularly when they're they're that far from home so that's the that's the word on the street I mean they, they may turn around with a five year extension and, and I've made him an offer he can't refuse but um, I'd be surprised if that happened I think at this stage OK uh, Cardiff 20 Munster 13 first defeat to Cardiff in four years for Munster Cardiff scored an early try they were 12-6 ahead at half time Munster uh, were leading with 15 minutes to go but then a penalty and a try for Cardiff secured the win Again, um, further to your point, uh, Keith, Cardiff had quite a strong team out. Uh, Munster are, are, are regrouping and there was Peter O'Mahony's wedding and the frontliners aren't quite back yet. So there's uh, mitigation uh, plenty. But that said, the, the general assessment of the performance, particularly around the breakdown, is that Munster were poor and it was scrappy and there were errors and it was all a touch uh, lethargic. And, then, you know, that's kind of not what you, you look for under uh, new management first game in. No, it's not. But you, you know, I'm not. I don't want to go in straight apologising. But I, I thought there were a lot of mistakes. I thought the their mindset wasn't quite there. wasn't quite fully focused. It's whether this was a match almost too early for them. That's what it kind of looked like. Uh, defensive structures were poor. Tackling was poor. Um, breakdown was was poor. I, the delay getting players to the breakdown was, you know, that sort of sharpness that's required. Um, when you looked at the team, there was there's a lot of good players in that team and you'd expect more from them. Um, Cardiff looked, I'm going to say, smarter on the day and that's kind of smarter with bigger players doing the right thing. Fallot had a fantastic game, um, had a huge impact on the game. Um yeah, it's just, it's hard to get overly energised by any of these matches. And um, I just find that, yeah, you know, everybody's in such a, a wish and an urge for something fantastic to happen. Not everybody, but Monster fans are, and they want to see Monster climb up again. They don't want to hear that this is about rebuilding, which of course it is. Um, they want to see uh, an instantaneous change to the manner in which they played. Um, the only comparison I can give, which isn't the same comparison, but it is a comparison nonetheless, was that Ireland struggled to um, shake off some of the confines of Joe Schmidt's last or season. Ireland did. Um, uh, it took a while for Andy Farrell to get the team to kind of um, really enjoy themselves and express themselves properly. Um, I think it'll take a while for Monster to move on from uh, from Van Graan. And uh, that particular style of rugby has been there for five years. I don't know if you can turn off that, that tap. So I'm looking forward to see how that changes over a period of time. Having said that, I still would have expected Monster to win and they were still in a position to win. So they'll be very frustrated with that at the end of it. Yeah. Would you have said, Rory, we saw in, in stylistic terms, ball in hand, anything uh, dramatically different from Van Graan? Yeah, it looked like they were trying to play, but unfortunately they kept dropping the ball. So, I mean, the, there were there were glimpses of what Mike Prendergast is trying to bring to the party. And look, anyone who's watched Rossing over the last couple of years, albeit he had the pick of you know the Harlem Globetrotters, Harlem Globetrotters style backline that was there, but he's he's you know he's a Player, so he's a coach who wants them to play. You know, he's come in after a number of years in France to his home prov province, and he wants the team to 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 be in his image. And, and I think that's we're going to see that over the course of the season. There was a lot less contestable kicks, but unfortunately, and this is probably one of the teething problems that's going to come from that is that they weren't they weren't resourcing the breakdown as Keith has referenced, and they kept getting turned over. So that was they just couldn't get momentum into yeah. the game. But yeah, there were there were signs, and it will take time. But I, I just wonder about how they've managed their preseason and giving the players a week off just before the start of the campaign seems like a very questionable decision. Um, that was the wedding, was it? Or it was after. I don't know. It was a, I don't know what I don't know what the conversation was or the order in which things happened. Were they given the weekend off and things were scheduled? But this is yeah. The, a lot of the players were at a wedding um, quite recently before the, before the season, which strikes me as, a, as an unusual um, thing to that that could happen. And, and that's like there are eight, eighteen. Games. Keith's touched on how this has made this a more difficult thing for, for teams more because of a sprint. it's more of a sprint you've 18 games and last year they ended up in in Belfast for a quarter final and they got hockeyed and part of the reason they got hockeyed they didn't show up but if that game was at Thoman Park they would have had a they, I would suggest they would have had a much better performance and one of the things Van Grant talked about throughout his reign was they kept ending up in the RDS for either for quarterfinals or semi-finals in the URC or in Dublin or or in France for semi-finals in Europe and getting home advantage especially when your home advantage is as important as as Munsters is but Thoman is such an effective home venue for them is key and and like you know 
these are games like Cardiff away is a difficult game Cardiff are quite good look quite good on Saturday but you know Munster need to be targeting these games to take at least you know a couple of points home and it's look I think it might be a long season in terms of it's they're betting a lot of new stuff in and we will have to be patient to some degree because they are doing that but um, they're not hitting the ground running the, Dragons away is a pretty good second game for them to, to try and get get things going but again I think this is going to take a little while for it to click OK um, Zebra Parma as they're now known 29 Leinster uh, 33 in the north of Italy uh, Zebra on the scoreboard I saw I, one commentator re- referred to them as Rugby Parma and they have the same jerseys now as the football team so I don't know what, what are we calling them I think Zebra Parma is the official name Zebra so, Parma yeah, okay. yeah. Um, they are wearing blue, even though you know they're they're not wearing black and white stripes, which they used to. But yeah, they're they've signed a few overseas players. I think they're twenty six new players this season, and um, twenty six, mm, okay. which I was expecting them to be less cohesive. They were actually quite good on Saturday. There. Yeah, well, it was it was kind of an odd game, Keith. Luke McGrath scores after six minutes uh, from close range. Then Reese Ruddock on twenty. There's um, a line out, and he peels off the line out, and you think, well, this is business as usual. There's another pick and jam at close range on twenty six minutes. So it's twenty one nil. And you, if you were a neutral, think, well, I can turn this off now. And then uh, Zebra Parma scored some nice tries, a bit of interplay, and, and suddenly there was four points in it at the end of the game. Um, I'm I'm presuming a fair degree of foot being taken off the pedal by Leinster, and you, you said maybe they treated it almost as a pre-season game. Well, I, look, I think there was bits of that as well, but equally well, there were 20, 21 points up, and Zebra had a guy in the bin, and Zebra were the ones who scored twice, actually, with a guy in the bin. So um, fine play, seeing the space where the space was, make, having the skill to put the ball where it was, one by by a kick, others by wide passing. Um, I I couldn't I couldn't quite get what Leinster were doing at it. And again, this comes back to all the other conversations we're having. So Leinster took their foot off the pedal in defence and suddenly got exposed a couple of times because you're not operating at a million miles an hour and not every there becomes little gaps little disjointed pieces of play um and it could have gone zebra's way at the end actually they um they they were they were hitting hard on it to try and get to the score at the end they were in Look, I don't know if they play at that standard all the time. I think a lot of teams will not view them as the simple knockover because you could knock them over in times past because they couldn't really get the ball out to the out to the wings and score in the corners. They can now, and they had a couple of players that they brought on seemed to be very good. That is seven, who his ball carrying alone was was truly phenomenal. So, um, I'm not I'm not quite sure that they will be. Um, vying for anything but they could be a proper banana skin now and I think that's that's one of the issues that goes so I think Leinster would be happy they've they've got over there got their win gone out of there you know and having said that there was nobody at the game so that was kind of interesting as well it was a very small crowd so um, there, there does need to be that up reaction on people watching the game for it to have the importance that they want it to have and at the present moment in time I don't quite know that the numbers are getting there No it's true and even the stand and the height of the camera feels a little bit AIL unfortunately but yeah. that's where we are Yeah I, I suppose that performances like Saturday will hopefully get people through the gate and Treviso beat Glasgow on Friday night and beat them well and played very well I think they'll actually be they'll be quite confident coming to the RDS on Friday night even though Leinster will have a lot more their internationals but Cardiff and, ben- and Benetton and Zebra being hard to beat away from home it's really good for this competition it might not be good for like Munster to, to you know we'll go through it and but it, we sh- this should this is this is the most realistic avenue for Irish teams to win silverware it's what we have to talk about for most of the year that Europe has been condensed it's no longer there for us so we, we need this tournament to be a far more compelling thing you know it's it's free to air so a lot more people are watching it when it was um, behind a paywall it was getting very little few eyeballs on it but a lot you know the, those two games were on RTE and then TG Carr had the, the evening game you know a lot more people are watching this game and if they're closer games it's it's only going to be good for, for the provinces I think long term because they'll be better you know Leinster will be certainly better battle tested at the end of it you know, I don't, you know we want I think you want close games across no, the board No you do you yeah. do like the perennial problem with this and anecdotally talking to uh, journalists and and just um, people in my circle alike. When you're, you these games come up this weekend, it's that issue that Keith referenced at the very start. Well, uh, who's playing their strongest team? Which team are fit? Uh, who had the wedding? Who didn't have the wedding? All of this kind of stuff undermines the whole. Like, uh, why would the average sports person or, or sports fan get that excited by it when really you don't know how seriously 
I know the teams want to win, but in terms of preparation and personnel uh, being named, how seriously they're taking it. Like, could you imagine the opening weekend of the Premier League? And we were sitting here on a Monday night on the football show saying, well, Spurs didn't really play their best team, so it's hard to know what to take from their loss. And yeah, even, like, even the quarterfinals last year, Leinster beat Glasgow by a cricket score and Ulster beat Munster in, in what, an Irish derby. And both stadiums were very they had a lot of empty seats I wouldn't say half empty but they were both very poorly attended games the semi-final Leinster Bulls wasn't very well attended so this is even filtering through to the, the moments where the internationals are on board and um, the Irish derbies you know increasingly Munster Leinster derbies now are very missable events in comparison with just a decade ago yeah and season tickets are like the, you know we saw during Covid how difficult um, things went when things went behind closed doors season tickets are, are the, the lifeblood of, of the, the provinces so I don't know is there is there a case we made for the provinces releasing the names earlier I mean like Leinster are playing Treviso on Friday he should be getting out the word out of who's actually going to be playing so oh, that people oh. can actually show up you know what if it's not a good line of playing well maybe they, yeah maybe they, 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 that's why teams pick stronger teams for home games I'm not, you know you're right That's there is a counter argument to that but um um, these are the flaws of this tournament but I suppose if Zebra are strong and Cardiff are strong sure. then you can't rest your players as much and I suppose Keith the problem is that in uh, a week's time and uh, we, we can remember this conversation when we're talking about player welfare and protecting players from playing too many games so these are just the issues well it is and actually um, it's funny when you look at it when you start discussing the economics of the game and you watch what's happening in the UK and with Worcester, with Wasps, apparently there's five teams in, in England looking to, to, to sell um, that are up for sale. Um, I heard that during the week. I'm not sure whether that's true or not. But uh, like that idea of a season that lasts the length of time of the season lasts and how it fits in together and how it's funded by the international game is something that has never been fully worked out to make any sense. So if you look at the debt level of the teams in the UK who are on their own, that aren't uh, formally linked to um, to the governing body of that country, they're all absolutely up to their oxters in debt. And that's it's just a huge issue. So like I keep looking back at a conversation I had with Ger Gilroy about during lockdown, actually, um, and we talked about the comparisons almost with the the NFL season of sixteen regular season matches and four playoffs and the finals, and they're small numbers by comparison to um, starting the season in the last week of August and finishing some stage in in June or at the end of a of a tour, you know. And the guys have played last year all the way from one end to the next. Um, the amount of travel that's, that that entails is pretty extraordinary. We've made that travel um, uh, more damaging, I think, by by long flights to South Africa, even though it's on the same time zone. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly very tough. And um, will it get to the point where enough of teams fall by the wayside so that you end up having uh, the strongest who have survived and are able to go and play? Or are there going to be changes to the game and to the way the game is set up. I mean, there was an interesting article from Ian McGeekin in The Telegraph yesterday talking about the removal of subs, which is something we've been banging on about for 20 years. And so the squads that have the biggest strength and depth tend to be the ones that are able to finish the games better. Mm. And like that, there's no equity in that. And it's trying to figure out exactly where the game is. I, I keep saying that we're still a very young professional sport, but we do need to find some solutions to it and we seem to be a bit away from that at the present moment in time. Uh, we do, we sure do, because even, um, well, the derbies not being what they were is, is um, frustrating enough, but even I, th- I think recent Christmas is Rory and it's like, well, the games between the Irish provinces will send our weakened team for the away match and then you send your weakened team for the away match and whether that's a wink and a nod or whether it's actually written down or mandated, I don't know. But I mean, the fan is looking on in amusement saying, what, what is this pantomime that I'm kind of watching, you know? Pantomime is the wrong word. But yeah, you know, and conversely, we're, go- we're going to get a run. There's a, there's a derby. This is last weekend without a derby until November, November International. So we're going to get a run of them where we'll have pretty yeah. much fully stacked teams. And that's the beauty of the, these interpros. We're going to see, and there's Ireland plays up for grabs in November. There's, there's narratives. We'll be actually talking about them yeah. here because they are the best Irish players against each other. But it's the give and take, and it's the, you know November. The Christmas is the time where the internationals go on holidays. That's 
that's when they're given their, their, their break and, and they're you know it makes sense for Munster to say to their internationals you go away when we're up in Belfast because we need you here for Stevens' day for Leinster because that's when we sell we sell out guaranteed every year yes, we sell this game yes. out and whereas Leinster will, will do the opposite so there, there is set logic to it and then you've got 20, 35 emerging Ireland players heading off to South Africa for three pointless games next week um, with the World Cup in, uh, goal in mind that maybe this is the master stroke that we've you know maybe I'm completely misreading the situation but like that's another strain on the resources and stuff so it, like look we can we'll talk in circles about this all series, sure. season I think because with the World Cup at the end you know certain players will probably you know I wouldn't expect Johnny Sexton to feature too heavily in the URC this year I'd say Tyke Furlong will be lightly raced because we all want uh, at the end of the day we'll turn up in France next year wanting them to all to get to the World Cup semi-final final and win the, win the whole thing so yeah. there is there are too many it, it goes back to Keith right the, the season is, ro- is structured wrong it's never been fixed there are too many games Um Everyone knows less is more, but nobody can. No one's willing to pull the plug and start again and rewrite it. And there's too many different vested interests, and it's it's a complete mess. You know, when it works, when we get a good game, it's great. But really, the season is set up to fail in, in many ways. Mm. Uh, just a, a quick um, question on the Leinster game, Keith, as well. Jason Jenkins uh, via Munster played 53 minutes. He scored a try. Uh, possible to say much about his uh, prospects this season based on the weekend? Yeah, not you can't say a huge amount based on the weekend. Um, you can't say a huge amount based on his time in, in Munster either. Um, he was injured for, for the vast majority of it. We saw him only a little bit. Um, there's an opportunity for him to be a big impact player, and that's what Leinster need. I think if, if you were to describe the shortcomings in Leinster, um, you'd say there are very, very few. Um, but the idea of having... Brad Thorne, who I still think is the player that they've been looking to replace. Um, they seemed to be at their most potent when they had an enforcer in the second row. Um, and I think that's where they are. When it, when he hit something, it moved. I think that was the key thing. Like he, He's an absolute unit. Like he's huge. And um, there was Cormac Isakuchu. I hope I pronounced that right up in Ulster, who came off the bench, a young Irish player who's come from the Sevens programme, has a great backstory. When he, whatever he hit against Connacht, it moved. He's going to have he, if if they can keep him fit and keep. I think he's quite young to the position and the sport, but he's a second row. His athletic profile looks like something we just don't get, and he, he looks like he could give Ulster the same thing. But it's a, such an important position. The French call it the tractor lock. Um, if Jenkins can stay fit, I think he can give so, so, something to Leinster. But it's the if is the big problem. Okay, well that's weekend one, and we'll let the thing um, develop and settle down over the coming weeks and, and chat as we go. Uh, Keith, uh, I I suspect you absolutely want to talk about the passing of uh, the great man who you would have worked with for uh, many many years and seen at close quarters yeah Eddie Butler um, I worked with Eddie for 21 years which uh, seems like an eternity and it wasn't because any time you spent in his company was pretty fantastic um, it was a huge shock a huge shock over I got a call from the BBC just to just to kind of pre-warn me of it and um, you, when he passed away before it hit the, hit the wires but uh, he was an amazing guy. He was a, a kind of really good social thinker. Now everybody's going to talk about uh, his his rugby commentary, but he was a he was a social thinker. He was a believer in um, and having a purposeful life. Um, the conversations we used to have on a Friday evening before the internationals. I mean, we would bore everybody within within earshot. So, you know, a lot of guys would disappear if we get stuck into something or one or other topics. Um, but he was uh, he was a wonderfully warm man. And uh, I would have said that his ability to show empathy, to, um, to have a turn of phrase, to... He was never in a rush. He was never in a rush his whole life. Um, he retired from rugby after playing on the lines. I think he was 26 or 27 when he stopped because he wanted to be a journalist. It's all he ever wanted to be. And I don't know that he necessarily wanted to be a broadcaster, but he became a broadcaster. Um, he had this fantastic phrase. But actually what I thought he had that held him above all others was his ability to write for television was extraordinary. And he could write a pause in in um, a little dialogue and the pause would have more meaning than anything else. I mean, he seemed to get everything right all the time. Um, I miss him because he was a, he was a pretty cool guy, a very different guy, um, and sports is definitely the lesser for his passing. You mentioned a social thinker, and um, Neil Francis yesterday was writing in the Sunday Times and just recalling some conversations with him, and he said that Butler 
uh, had an authoritative opinion or, or uh, was informed on almost any subject. And you mentioned those conversations on, on Friday night. So uh, that tally with the man you knew as well, this was not a guy talking about rugby 90% of his time. We never talked about rugby. And actually our conversations on a Friday might have had 5% rugby, um, something that was relevant or indicative for the following day. Um, but for the most part, it was on the way of things. I think it was the easiest way to put it. And uh, you delve into everything. He was incredibly well read. Um, he ha- was a man of opinions. Um, but he wasn't bound to the opinion. He he wanted perspectives, so he was always looking for a different perspective. Um, he had a cracking mind. Mm. You had a good sense of him as well, Rory. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have known him as well as Keith, but I've done a couple of Lions tours, and Eddie did write for The Guardian as well as broadcast. Now he's better known for his broadcasting, but he was really a really excellent journalist as well. Just a very warm man and, and a man of great depth, you know, and... When I was a young journalist coming onto the scene, sometimes it's, it can be quite a daunting place. And he was quite a famous person, you know. You knew who he was before he, but he didn't have any um, airs of graces. Um, you can be quite trite or cliche when you talk about people who just passed away. But he was just a lovely guy. Mm. Yeah, and uh, you sure. know, as you said, Keith, he's, he's uh, so much more than the brilliant commentator that we all know. But I mean, goodness me, when you tucked in for an Eddie Butler game that he was calling that was that was a treat as well you know for, for so many of us because he was just so extraordinary at that yeah. well I think it will I think he'll, he'll also be remembered uh, as uh, as the foil for Brian Moore and Brian Moore is the foil for him and uh, they got on after a fashion and it hmm. was re- always really interesting to watch how they got on um, because they did get on Um um, they were, uh, but they they rubbed each other up the wrong way often on, on a, a sort of emotional um, uh, country fan uh, idea. So they both tried to pretend that they were um, they were balanced, um, and they both kind of fa- fa- failed on it, you know. But it was um, actually look, so, there's so many of us. The way he rolled the, the, the names off the tongue, yeah. the way he got excited by that. He was more excited by the idea that you might have had France playing against Tonga. That would just excite the hell out of him for the for the linguistics uh, that he'd have to try and manoeuvre around. Um, but he found joy in an awful lot of stuff. He, he lived on a farm for, for quite a while and he loved the country life. And, you know, again, that idea of... Um, of being involved in things. If you ask him to do anything, he'd just do it automatically. I mean, he did some voiceovers for me for for charity things that, um, like, these weren't things that would be done, well, you, you'd spend six weeks trying to do it and he'd have it done in 10 minutes, but he would do it better than the six weeks that you'd spent on it because he had an unbelievable skill. Yeah, yeah. And it is, I mean, it is a superficial thing, Rory, to say, but I mean, just the quality of his voice and the accent is just so beautiful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny, he did a bit of URC work the last couple of years for Premier Sport, but it just never sounded right because it never felt like it was a big enough occasion I for guess. his presence. You know, he yeah. he he was made for the Six Nations. He, you yeah. know, I know yeah. Bill Tarrant was I the had voice. That, that, sorry, you know, the same talk. Well, I flick onto URC and Eddie was doing a, a, a game with 2,000 people watching the Dragons. I said, well, Eddie Butler shouldn't have to be doing no, this. No, it's beneath him. Yeah, no, it, it, it was funny. It, yeah, the, the Six Nations befitted him. Him in, in many ways, and no, like I mean, so many of like Bill McLaren would have been the voice of rugby in my childhood, but Eddie Butler became you know in a very different way, a different style, a different you know a very different man. I would imagine um, became like so synonymous with so many big moments in, in Irish sport as, as as well. I know he's a British broadcaster, but you know a lot of people choose to watch the, the Six Nations on the BBC partly because him and Brian Moore were so good together, um, and. I think the Six Nations is. I, I know ITV have some of the rights in the UK anyway, but I think it's going to be very strange next year turning into the Six Nations without him. And that's it's deeply sad. And even the fact that he was off in in Peru, you know, on a charity hike, um, like what a way to go! Like it's just it's it's incredibly incredibly sad. It's just far too soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one of those uh, rare broadcasters that elevates the event as opposed to the other way around. Uh, you get one bite at this each because clock is so against us. This Matthew Rinal uh, decision, Australia. New Zealand is, is lingering on. New Zealand win 37-34. In effect, there's 90 seconds remaining. Australia get a penalty. And uh, Reynal deduces there's been time wasting and so scrum New Zealand. And uh, Australia have written a letter of complaint to World Rugby about uh, Reynal. So, 
Um, I'll give you final word, Keith. Rory, you can you can tell us here. Is this attention grabbing on Reynal's part, or is this somebody trying to enforce the rules and Australia deep down know they were in the wrong, or where are we? Well, Australia will never admit they were wrong. I think Reynal was right, but I hope this is the beginning of a war on time wasting, which is a scour- scourge on all sports, but particularly rugby, where the entire last denouement of a game can be spent either scrummaging or picking and going or walking to a line out so if this is the beginning of a, of, of a war on time wasting I'm all for it if it's a once off incident which will never be repeated then what was the point and it was very that would be very unfair on Australia they, he warned them enough times he, you know Foley should have kicked the ball mm. he, was, he was right to do it but I'd like to see referees double down on it now because a, more ball and time ball, ball and play time and more drama is what we want from the sport yeah Keith yeah, he, I don't think he was right because he should have been doing it from the very start of the game and what actually ended up having an impact on the score at the very end of it and we're discussing referees again. So I would rather they go back to being far tougher on the players, um, far tougher in terms of discipline and conversation back to the referees and any time wasting should be done from the very start of the game to make it as an impact call with a couple of minutes to go was wrong. Mm. Why do you think at that moment he decided? Well, here, here, here's the here's the moment, the decisive moment of the game for me to yeah suddenly become a, a stickler for time. Let's get him on and ask him. Yeah, he's French. <laughs> he's French. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fellas. Uh, thank you very much. URC is back up and running. Rory, thank you for coming to the studio. Hi, nice Joe. That's the uh, nice see you, Keith. Irish Independent and Keith Wood. Pleasure. Thanks, Keith. Cheers, gents. Cheers. Our rugby and off the ball, of course, is with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us